Hi, this is Matt Baker. Today I'm going to give you a quick overview of the history of Vancouver, a city located on the west coast of Canada and the city that I happen to call home. From one perspective, Vancouver is a very new city. This is because when the European settlers arrived in North America, they settled the continent from east to west, meaning that Vancouver was actually one of the last places to be reached. For example, when Vancouver was founded in 1886, the city of Boston, on the other coast, was already 256 years old. However, from a different perspective, what we now call Vancouver is actually a very old city. In fact, the land that it sits on is one of the oldest continuously inhabited areas in North America. This is because when the indigenous peoples arrived, they settled the continent in the opposite direction, from west to east, meaning that Vancouver was actually one of the first places to be reached. For a long time, it was thought that the Clovis people were the first humans to arrive in North America, traveling over land via an ice-free corridor around 13,000 years ago. However, it is now thought that the first humans to arrive actually did so by boat, traveling along the coast. This hypothesis was bolstered in 2017 when archaeologists found the remains of a coastal village a bit north of Vancouver dating to at least 14,000 years ago. Now at this point, I want to introduce you to the three First Nations that were living in Vancouver long before the arrival of European settlers and who still live here today. These are the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish, all of whom belong to a broader ethnic group known as the Coast Salish. The Musqueam lived primarily along what is now called the Fraser River, whereas the Tsleil-Waututh lived primarily along what is now called the Burrard Inlet. Originally, the Squamish lived primarily around what is now called Howe Sound, although they too ended up settling around the Burrard Inlet for reasons I'll get to in a bit. But one thing I want to make clear is that indigenous nations differ significantly from European nations in that they don't tend to have firm boundaries. For example, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish overlap quite a bit. If we go back 10,000 years, the water level was higher, and therefore the coastline actually looked something like this which explains why the oldest Musqueam settlement, called Sequixin, was located here, where the mouth of the river would have been. Archaeological research at this site has indicated that the Musqueam ancestors were living here as far back as 9,000 years ago, and they were creating objects such as this one, which was found at the site. However, over time, as the coastline expanded, the Musqueam moved their main village to Tsnam, which is also referred to as the Marpole Midden. But eventually, by around 1,500 years ago, the main settlement was located at Musqueam, the village from which the nation takes its name, and which nowadays is the location of their main reserve. Currently, there are around 1,300 members of the Musqueam nation, about half of whom live on the Musqueam reserve. One well-known member is the artist Susan Point, whose work is prominently displayed at the Vancouver International Airport. To the north of the Musqueam live the tsleil who spoke the same language, known as Downriver Hakumalam. Originally, their main settlement was at Tamtamawetan, now known as Belkara, although they also had many other villages along the Burrard Inlet. They called the inlet tsleil which is where the name tsleil comes from. Nowadays, they have around 600 members, and their administrative offices are located here. The most well-known member of the tsleil is probably Chief Dan George, who became an actor and starred alongside Clint Eastwood in The Outlaw Josie Wales, and alongside Dustin Hoffman in Little Big Man, for which he received an Oscar nomination. Just prior to the arrival of European settlers in the region, a smallpox epidemic swept through the area, most likely having been introduced by Europeans further south. The tsleil were particularly hard hit and were almost wiped out completely. Because of this, they allowed the Squamish to come down and settle Burrard Inlet alongside them. For example, they shared a village in what is now Stanley Park, called Quaqua, 
In fact, the Musqueam also used this village and may have used it for over 3,000 years. However, the main Squamish settlement in the Vancouver area was located at the base of the Capilano River and was called Quimulchin. Take note that all of the various things in Greater Vancouver named Capilano, such as the river, lake, university, and suspension bridge, are all named after a Squamish chief named Joe Capilano, who in turn got his name from the people who lived near Quimulchin. Overlooking Quimulchin, and visible from many parts of Vancouver, are two peaks that are usually called the Lions. However, the Squamish call them the Two Sisters, because legend has it that they were made to commemorate a peace treaty between themselves and the Haida, which involved twin brothers from the Haida nation marrying twin sisters from the Squamish nation. Another place name with Squamish origins is Kitsilano. It's named after August Jack Katsilano, whose grandfather was chief of a village called Snock. Now, I've chosen to highlight the Musqueam Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish because these are the three nations whose traditional territory overlaps with the modern boundaries of the city of Vancouver, which is why they are the three who are mentioned during land acknowledgements, statements that are heard quite frequently in Vancouver at the start of formal speeches or seen at the bottom of websites. However, I do want to make it clear that there were and still are many other indigenous nations living in Greater Vancouver. These include the Coquitlam, after which the modern city of Coquitlam is named, as well as the Kekite, Tawasan, Semiamo, Katsi, and Kwantlen. It is estimated that the total population of all these nations around the year 1750 was perhaps as high as 100,000, although, like I mentioned earlier, there was a smallpox epidemic just prior to European contact that resulted in a major population decrease. However, the main point I want to make is that what we now call Greater Vancouver was quite densely populated long before the arrival of Europeans. While it was not one big sprawling metropolis like it is today, it was a collection of many small towns and villages bustling with activity. Now, when it comes to European contact, that happened for the first time in 1791, when a Spanish explorer named Jose Navarrez arrived and had a brief encounter with the Musqueam. Then, just one year later in 1792, the British explorer, George Vancouver, also passed by. He crossed paths with some other Spanish explorers and met with them on a beach, which is now called Spanish Banks. George Vancouver's father was from the Dutch town of Coverden, so his surname would actually have been Van Coover, meaning from Coverden. So that explains why Vancouver is called Vancouver. But George Vancouver did not actually stay long, nor was there any attempt made at a British settlement during the 1700s. The next European to pass by was the British explorer Simon Fraser in 1808. He actually came from the opposite direction, having traveled overland and then down the river that now bears his name. Note that he's also the namesake of Simon Fraser University. By this point, the Spanish had basically given up their claim to the area, but the British now had a new competitor, the Americans. You see, they too had reached the Pacific Ocean overland. In fact, they did so a few years before Simon Fraser when Lewis and Clark arrived via the Columbia River. Therefore, in 1818, the U.S. and the U.K. agreed to share the area. The British called it the Columbia District, while the Americans called it Oregon Country. But of course, both sides forgot to ask the indigenous population what they thought. In 1824, the British founded Fort Vancouver. Not here, but here. It served as the end point of the York Factory Express, which became a major trading route across the continent. Then, in 1827, they established Fort Langley, the first European settlement in what is today Greater Vancouver. So, initially, it looked like the whole area, all the way down to the Columbia River, would eventually become British. But then, in 1843, the Oregon Trail opened up, and around a 1,000 Americans arrived and started to settle the West Coast, 
At this point, it became clear that a firm boundary would have to be set. The Columbia River seemed like an obvious choice, but in the end, in 1846, the British agreed to the 49th parallel instead, with the exception of this island, known as Vancouver Island. Note that the explorer George Vancouver got quite a few things named after him. Marking the border at the 49th parallel led to a strange situation that exists in Greater Vancouver to this day, Point Roberts. It belongs to the U.S., but its residents are cut off from the rest of their country. Also take note that nowadays, along this part of the border, there is simply two roads parallel to each other, and Canadians and Americans can simply walk up to each other and say hello. There are cameras monitoring things, but security is nowhere near as heavy as it is at the Mexico-U.S. border. But back to the mid-1800s. In 1858, the area to the north of the 49th parallel became the colony of British Columbia. The new colony needed a capital, and originally the plan was to build it across the river from Fort Langley. But instead, this site was chosen and named New Westminster. However, it did not remain a capital for long. You see, originally, Vancouver Island was a separate colony with its own capital at Victoria. But then in 1866, the two colonies merged and Victoria was chosen to be the capital of the whole thing. Now, at this point, I want to point out the fact that unlike in most other parts of what is today Canada, no treaty was ever made between European settlers and First Nations with regards to most of the territory that now comprises British Columbia. In other words, the territory was never actually ceded, which has led to all kinds of legal problems that still exist to this day. That said, let me now show you how the modern city of Vancouver came to be. Initially, New Westminster was the main European settlement in the area. And all of this was simply considered the outskirts of New West. But that would eventually change. It all started with the founding of Stamps Mill in 1865. To this day, the lumber industry is a major player in Vancouver's economy. This is because the area has some of the largest trees in the entire world. Around the same time, what is now Stanley Park was designated as a military reserve and a road was built between it and New Westminster using an old trail that had been used by First Nations for generations. This would later become Kingsway, a major thoroughfare through Vancouver to this day. Tourism is another big industry that has been in Vancouver from the start. During the 1860s, the New Brighton Hotel opened up here, named after the popular seaside resort in England and the area around it was designated as the Hastings Township. Today, this area is the site of the PNE, an amusement park and outdoor performance venue. This year, it was host to Boys to Men, Boney M, and many others. Another major milestone occurred in 1867, when an Englishman named Gassy Jack opened a pub near Stamps Mill in order to cater to the workers. That pub became the first building in what would eventually become downtown Vancouver. A small settlement built up around the pub that became known as Granville, although it was also simply known as Gastown. For years, Gastown was marked by this statue of Gassy Jack. But in 2022, the statue was torn down when protesters argued that he was definitely not the type of man that deserves a statue. After all, at age 40, he quote-unquote married a native girl who was only 12. She ended up running away from him at age 15 after he got her pregnant. Of course, the other major event that occurred in 1867 was that Canada became a country. Initially, Canada did not include British Columbia. And in fact, around this time, BC actually considered joining the United States instead. However, that did not happen. Instead, Canada managed to convince BC to join it in 1871, based on the promise that a transcontinental railroad would be built within the next 10 years. They were a little late, but in 1886, the ceremonial last spike for the Canadian Pacific Railway was hammered in. 
However, at that point, the exact terminus for the railroad had not yet been established. Originally, the plan was to have it end at the newly built town of Port Moody, just north of New Westminster. But instead, the provincial government managed to convince the railway executives to extend the line to Granville in exchange for a bunch of free land. That same year, in 1886, Granville changed its name to Vancouver and officially incorporated as a city, with its original boundaries set at what would become Alma Street, 16th Avenue, and Nanaimo Street. To this day, the original boundaries are noticeable because near them, the cross streets don't quite line up correctly. Anyway, CP Rail was able to sell off its land bit by bit, and thus the company became extremely wealthy and powerful, basically directing the first few decades of Vancouver's growth. Things got off to a bad start, though, when a fire destroyed most of the city in the same year that it was incorporated. But after that, the city started to grow fast. And in fact, it is still growing at a very fast pace today. Starting in 1886, real estate speculators bought land in Vancouver, built buildings, and then flipped them for a profit, a trend that continues to this day and which has resulted in Vancouver being one of the most expensive North American cities to live in, especially when it comes to housing. For example, this modest house is currently for sale. Can you guess how much the asking price is? The answer is $2.2 million. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the late 1800s and pick up the story from there. Once the CPR was in charge, they shifted the downtown area from Gastown to the area around Granville Street, which ran from Waterfront Station across a newly built bridge and then down through what was then a dense forest. Note also that this body of water, known as False Creek, was originally larger and that what is now Main Street had to cross a bridge close to what is now Science World. It led to Vancouver's first suburb, Mount Pleasant, which is now not a suburb at all, but rather a core part of the city. From the very beginning, the areas west of Main Street became the more wealthy areas, and the areas east of Main Street became the more poorer, working-class areas, a trend that basically continues to this day. In 1888, the city council made an important decision. They designated what had previously been a military reserve as a park instead. It became Stanley Park, which is to this day one of Vancouver's greatest features. It was named after Canada's governor general at the time, Lord Frederick Stanley, the person for whom the Stanley Cup, hockey's greatest prize, is also named after. Sadly, the Vancouver Canucks, the city's NHL team, has never won that cup. However, a much earlier team called the Vancouver Millionaires did, way back in 1915. Another key feature of Vancouver from the start was its port. Here's what it looked like around the turn of the century. You see, Vancouver's location on the west coast of Canada allowed it to become a key point on what was called the All Red Route, a global network that allowed trade and travel to occur throughout the the British Empire without passengers having to pass through any non-British countries. Now, being a coastal city, one popular pastime that developed in Vancouver was swimming. For this reason, a man named Joe Fortas, Vancouver's first official lifeguard, became one of its most popular early residents. Now, in other parts of North America, most cities were built before modern things like electricity and streetcars came along. But Vancouver was being built right around the same time when these things were brand new, and therefore it was able to be built as a modern city from the get-go. Whereas most cities had to build streetcar lines through already existing neighborhoods, in Vancouver, the streetcar lines often came first, therefore impacting where the neighborhoods ended up. A good example of this is the Commercial Drive area, which is where I happen to live. The streetcar line that ran from Vancouver all the way to New Westminster passed through this area, and therefore it became very commercial, which is why it's named the way it is. Later, it became a popular area for Italian immigrants, and therefore today is known as Little Italy. Commercial Drive is also the location of the new Useful Charts store, 
If you're familiar with this channel, you'll know that we sell many of our charts as posters, such as our timeline of world history and our evolution and classification of living things. So if you happen to live in Vancouver, feel free to drop by. We're located at 2916 Commercial Drive and are open seven days a week from 12 noon to 4 p.m. We're just a few blocks south of the SkyTrain station and there's also a great new bookstore nearby and a board game shop, so it's well worth the trip. But back to the history of Vancouver. From the very beginning, Vancouver has always been a very multi-ethnic city. For example, it is the most Asian city outside of Asia, with around 50% of its residents being of Asian descent. The two largest Asian groups are those with Chinese ancestry and those with Punjabi ancestry. However, unfortunately, these communities got off to a rough start when it came to being treated equally. Many of the early Chinese settlers were former railway workers who were willing to work for less than half of what whites were paid. Initially, they were forced to pay a head tax as well and were only allowed to live in what became Canada's first and largest Chinatown, still located here. Then in 1907, there were three days of anti-Asian riots aimed at both Chinese and Japanese immigrants. Things have gotten better since then, but unfortunately, anti-Asian racism does still exist today and in fact has been on the rise again because of COVID. In the early 1900s, India was still part of the British Empire and therefore as British subjects, Punjabis were supposed to be able to travel to and settle in Canada if they wanted. However, in 1914, 352 passengers traveling on a boat named the Kamagata Maru were turned away and forced to return to India, where 26 of them were killed and another 200 imprisoned because they were suspected to be political agitators. Despite this unfortunate incident, many Punjabis did end up settling in Vancouver, initially in this area here, which today is known as Punjabi Market, or Little India. One fact about Vancouver that is less well known is that it once had a mostly black community at a location known as Hogan's Alley. It was home to Vi's Chicken and Steakhouse, which played host to many musical greats, such as Louis Armstrong, Count Bassie, and Nat King Cole. However, Hogan Alley's most famous resident was Nora Hendricks, who was frequently visited by her grandson, Jimi Hendrix. Sadly, most of Hogan's Alley was razed to the ground during the 1960s to make way for a freeway that was never built. Another sad chapter in Vancouver's history occurred between the years 1899 and 1958. This is when the St. Paul's Residential School operated in North Vancouver, a school that many children from the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations were forced to attend. Operated by both churches and the government, Canada's residential school system is now seen as being a form of genocide because it specifically aimed to, quote, kill the Indian in the child, end quote, and hence fully destroy indigenous language and culture. We also now know that these schools were places where both physical abuse and sexual abuse occurred, and where malnutrition and disease were allowed to go unchecked. Fortunately, Canada is now starting to reconcile with this dark phase in its history by focusing on a truth and reconciliation process. In fact, September 30th is now National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. There's obviously still a lot of work to be done, but thankfully, the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish are still here and to this day are an integral part of the city's population. Let me now continue with how the city of Vancouver evolved during the 20th century. In 1916, what had originally been a sandbar in Falls Creek was made into Granville Island, initially an industrial site, but nowadays a popular tourist destination filled with interesting shops, and a large public market. Around the same time, the eastern portion of False Creek was filled in, and another railway company, CN, built its terminus station, called Pacific Central, here. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the original borders of Vancouver were different than they are today, 
Everything to the south of 16th Avenue was originally going to become part of Burnaby, but then in 1892, it incorporated as South Vancouver. Although a bit later in 1908, the western half split off to become a separate city called Point Grey. But then a process of amalgamation occurred. First in 1910, Hastings Township joined Vancouver, and then in 1929, the three cities of Vancouver, South Vancouver, and Point Grey all combined together to form the city of Vancouver with the borders that it has today. At this point, a new city hall was built near to where the three original cities used to connect. Now, you'll note that this part over here is not actually part of Vancouver. It was designated early on as the University Endowment Lands and is now the site of UBC, Western Canada's largest university. And to the south is Sea Island, which is actually a part of Richmond. In 1931, it became home to the region's first airport, which today is the Vancouver International Airport, also known as YVR. To the north, Vancouver has two major bridges connecting it to the North Shore. The more famous one is the Lionsgate Bridge, built in 1931. The other one, called the Second Narrows Bridge, was actually built before this, although the original was eventually replaced by a new bridge, also called the Iron Workers Memorial Bridge, named after 18 workers who died during construction. One of Vancouver's most iconic buildings was also built during the 1930s, the Hotel Vancouver. For many decades, it was Vancouver's tallest building, although nowadays it has been eclipsed by 34 skyscrapers that are even taller. One of the most recent ones is this unique tower, built in 2020 and called Vancouver House. Also well known is Harbour Centre, which has a revolving restaurant on top and is located near Canada Place, a convention centre and cruise ship terminal with an iconic roof that looks like a series of sails. One thing that makes Vancouver different from most other North American cities is that it has no freeway leading to the downtown core. Like I mentioned earlier, there was initially a plan to build one, but construction was stopped due to public backlash. Instead, Vancouver ended up with a unique public transport system, known as the SkyTrain. Although the downtown park goes underground like a subway, most of it is elevated, hence its name. The first line opened up in 1986. Its launch coincided with Expo 86, which was a world fair held in Vancouver that same year. That line is hence known as the Expo Line. The system expanded in 2002 with the Millennium Line, and then in 2009 with the Canada Line, built in time for the 2010 Winter Olympics. Since then, the Millennium Line has also been extended to Coquitlam and is currently being extended along Broadway, with plans for it to eventually go all the way to UBC. Now, unfortunately, I can't talk about the history of Vancouver without mentioning the downtown east side which, during the 1980s and 90s, descended into what is now Canada's poorest neighbourhood, known for its high levels of homelessness, drug use, and mental illness. It was also the location where Canada's worst serial killer, Robert Pickton, took his victims from, between 1982 and 2002, killing perhaps as many as 49 women, most of them prostitutes and several of them indigenous. For many years, the police bungled the case, due in part to systematic racism. But fortunately, in more recent times, there has been a rise in activism bringing attention to the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and the need for truth and reconciliation between settlers and First Nations. Okay, let me conclude by pointing out one of Vancouver's fastest-growing industries, film. Nowadays, as many as 50,000 Vancouverites work in the film industry, with Vancouver now being the third largest production center in North America, after Los Angeles and New York. That's why Vancouver is now nicknamed Hollywood North. TV shows filmed in Vancouver include The X-Files, Battlestar Galactica, Smallville, Supernatural, The Flash, Riverdale, and many more. That was a look at the history of Vancouver. If you found the video interesting, you might also be interested in this video by the channel Indigenous History Now, 
on the nearby city of Seattle. And don't forget, if you're ever in Vancouver, do come visit us at 2916 Commercial Drive. Thanks for watching.